This episode of Legal Eagle was made possible by Skillshare. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking on the link in the description. Unidentified federal officers wearing full camouflage, jumping out of unmarked vehicles, picking up seemingly random protesters, handcuffing them, and then speeding away. This isn't George Orwell's 1984. This is America, 2020, Portland, Oregon. There have been over 50 straight days of protests in Portland, Oregon, sparked by the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other citizens killed by police. These protests have been mostly peaceful, but a few people have committed acts of vandalism and property damage. But back in June, President Trump activated at least a dozen different law enforcement agencies to, quote, restore order during protests in Washington, D.C. Thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers. At the time, the federal government justified this show of force with vague references to D.C.'s status as not a state. But the show of force actually had little to do with D.C.'s precarious legal status. Instead, the response in D.C. was more like a dry run, a first attempt at using federal police to stop protests. Now, more than 100 law enforcement officers have been deployed to Portland, Oregon. And many of those officers are not identifying themselves verbally or through insignia on their uniforms. They're driving around in vehicles not marked as law enforcement, and they refuse to say who they are, even to those that they arrest. They have apparently kidnapped protesters off the street and taken them to jail cells. They've gone on the offensive and they've shot protesters with kinetic impact munitions. Federal officers have also sprayed tear gas at protesters, prompting Oregon moms to form a human shield to protect people who were peacefully protesting. They've attacked a Navy veteran who came to ask officers whether they understood the oath that they took to the US Constitution who just didn't respond like an absolute boss. All of this happened without the approval of Oregon state officials. All in all, this is a chilling show of force in allegedly free society. Are we witnessing military detention of protesters? Does the federal government have authority to do this? And do protesters have the right to fight back and stand their ground against people who are not clearly identified as law enforcement? And most importantly, how worried should we all be? Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer because there are reports of protesters in Portland, Oregon being disappeared by federal law enforcement, potentially operating outside of its jurisdictional limits. Now, in this episode, we're going to explain what the heck is going on in Portland. And if you're upset about what's happening, you're not alone. In fact, Oregon has already filed suit against the federal government to stop these tactics. But let's begin at the beginning with the jurisdiction of federal law enforcement officers operating in the states. The basic questions are which law enforcement agencies have authority over federal land and property, and under what circumstances can federal law enforcement go beyond just federal land and operate within the jurisdiction of the state? Now, Congress has the authority to create law enforcement organizations to patrol and protect areas of federal property. Violations occurring within the federal land will then be handled by federal law enforcement officers. For example, the Bureau of Land Management has the authority to undertake traditional police activities on BLM, the the other BLM lands, which include national parks, but they cannot make arrests under state laws unless they have written authorization by state or local officials. According to an opinion by the Office of Legal Counsel in 2012, federal law enforcement personnel lack the authority to make arrests under state law. And remember, state law is generally the one that we think of when we think of general criminal activities, the stuff that police often arrest people under, unless that authority is expressly granted by either federal or state law. And the federal officer's exercise of authority complies with the Purpose Act, which requires that federal funds be used only for the purposes for which they were appropriated. By the way, I am deeply indebted to law professor and lawfare contributor Steve Vladek on this. He's uh, on Twitter at, at Steve underscore Vladek. His research saved me a ton of time putting this together, and you should really follow him if you're into national security law. So which law enforcement agencies are active in situations like this? Well, the law enforcement response in Washington, D.C. involved many different agencies and the National Guard. And by most accounts, the D.C. response was coordinated by Attorney General Barr. Barr has legal authority to coordinate law enforcement officers who are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice, like the FBI and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. In contrast, the federal officers who are in Portland appear to be from the Customs and Border Protection. CBP is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security. So let's talk about the CBP's authority in Portland. Does it have legal authority to operate in Portland? Well. Yes, it probably does. The Fourth Amendment of the Constitution protects Americans from random and arbitrary stops and searches. However, these basic constitutional principles do not apply fully at the 
borders. Uh, at border crossings, including the ports of entry by the sea, federal authorities do not need a warrant or even suspicion of wrongdoing to justify conducting what the courts have called a, quote, routine search, such as searching luggage or a vehicle. The federal officers cannot suspend the U.S. Constitution, but the Supreme Court has given them more leeway in these activities. Federal regulations approved by the Supreme Court give the CBP authority to operate within 100 miles of any U.S., quote, external boundary. The closest international border to Portland is the Pacific Ocean. And the ocean is less than 100 miles away from Portland, which gives the CBP specific enforcement powers. This relaxation of constitutional protections within 100 miles of any external border and or an ocean has received a lot of criticism from civil libertarians, which correctly point out that the vast majority of Americans live within 100 miles of an external border. Although CBP has legal authority to enforce federal laws in Portland, they cannot enforce state laws. For example, CBP must have reasonable suspicion of an immigration violation or violation of federal law in order to pull someone over and to stop them. But of course, not surprisingly, the federal government does have authority to protect federal property and to investigate offenses against that federal property and federal land. And generally, the federal agency that's tasked with protecting federal property is the Federal Protective Service not the CBP. But here, and perhaps in the future, Customs and Border Patrol is being authorized under 40 U.S.C. 1315, which allows the Department of Homeland Security Secretary to designate uh, other DHS officers to backstop the Federal Protective Service. Section 1315, which was enacted over a decade ago, empowers the Department of Homeland Security to, quote, make arrests without a warrant for any offense against the United States committed in the presence of the officer or agent or for any felony cognizable under the laws of the United States if the officer or agent has reasonable grounds to believe that the person to be arrested has committed or is committing a felony. And under this section, unless the federal officer personally witnesses a federal crime being committed or has a reason to believe an individual committed a federal offense, the only authority under section 1315 is to investigate offenses against federal property, which again is generally the purview of the Federal Protective Services. And really here, the $64,000 question is, what qualifies as an investigation of an offense against federal property. But regardless of the authorization of these regulations, they're still limited by the Constitution. In order to be able to physically stop someone, you need reasonable suspicion. And according to the Supreme Court, in order to put someone in a van and drive them away, you have to have probable cause. And here there are reports, admittedly one-sided reports coming from the protesters themselves, that it doesn't seem like the federal officers have those kind of justifications. And it also appears that the federal officers are operating pretty far away from the federal property that they've been tasked to protect and potentially to investigate crimes related to. Well, we're 49 straight days into violence and destruction in Portland. So um, it justifies the response because violence and destruction continue. Now, that's not to say that the protests in Portland have been entirely nonviolent. It can be the case, as it appears to be here, that there can be some people who are out rioting and committing acts of violence and vandalism, while the vast majority of people are peacefully protesting. And the thing about that is that even if simple acts of vandalism did justify the use of force and query whether that's true or not, that doesn't justify using force against the overwhelmingly peaceful protesters of Portland and lots of other American cities. This is a possible we intend to continue, not just in Portland, but in any of the facilities that we're responsible for around the country. America is not under siege by protesters. And there's a concept in the First Amendment called the heckler's veto, that you are not allowed to use the violent reaction of a minority to quell the speech activity of the majority. That's a heckler's veto, and we, we don't want that. But you don't have to take my word for it. Let's kick it over to our correspondent in the field, a Portland resident and mom in the mom wall, and my sister, Lil Legal Eagle. Legal Eagle, we are here on a weekday. It's about 9.45 p.m. And as you can hear, we're singing dorky songs, and the moms and dads are out in the thousands. It feels very safe actually right now. So even though everybody has come prepared with uh, tear gas, accoutrements, some goggles, some um, some helmets, a lot, uh, people are passing out water. So far, it has felt very peaceful, and everybody is singing and getting along very well. So it's it's been a really wonderful experience so far. 
crowd has so far been very peaceful. So how this all started is, is a, a protest for Black Lives Matter, of course, spun off by uh, the murder of George Floyd. And since then, here in the past uh, three nights, there have been thousands of moms that have shown up to create a wall of moms. So the idea here is that all of us are in yellow. The dads are out tonight as well in orange. Uh, and we, the, the theme is that we're protecting the youth that are um, indiscriminately and illegally being abducted, beaten, uh, any number of things by the feds that have come into our city. So, so far the night has been absolutely lovely. It's a, a warm, balmy evening. We, uh, people have been passing out these little pig squeakers, which has been kind of delightful, very Portland of the city. Uh, and otherwise we've been singing, there have been people of color um, representing and uh, speaking up on stage and a lot of chants. So it's been a really nice night. Thanks, little sis. Really, truly terrifying stuff. I haven't seen that kind of carnage since the Women's March of Aught 17. Stay safe out there and don't get a paper cut on all those signs. Let's stay clear! The moms are here! So the next question naturally is, what federal laws are CBP officers trying to enforce in Portland? Unlike Washington, D.C., where there's quite a lot of federal property, Oregon really doesn't have that much property that's under the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal government. Federal law enforcement officers can arrest someone who vandalizes a federal building like a courthouse, which there are some in downtown Portland. And federal immigration authorities can arrest people for suspicion of violating immigration laws and for violating any federal law, provided the federal offense happened in the officer's presence. But federal law enforcement officers don't have the authority to enforce state laws on non-federal property. And when you're talking about vandalism of non-federal property, that would clearly be a state-based law. And here, the governor of Oregon does not want federal law enforcement in her state. That leaves us with a complicated situation that's susceptible to abuse by overzealous federal officers. So are federal officers simply protecting federal courthouses from vandalism in Portland? It definitely doesn't look that way. Reports suggest that CPB officers are roaming the streets a considerable distance from federal property. For example, protester Mark Pettibone was suddenly seized by camo-clad people and thrown into an unmarked minivan. Pettibone was taken to a cell in a federal courthouse where he was asked if he would would waive his rights. He answered no and was then apparently released. Pettibone wasn't charged with a crime. He says that the men who grabbed him did not identify themselves. CBP said that Pettibone and others who were detained were wanted for destruction of federal property or assault on federal officers. But there's been no proof of these allegations yet though, and the fact that these people are being detained, thrown in a cell, and then released without charges makes these arrests seem pretty dubious. CBP denies that its officers are not identified. The agency told reporters that their uniforms have a CBP patch, but officers are not identified by name because they might be docs, which might put their lives in danger. This might strike some of you as an acceptable reason not to identify officers by name, but note that even army soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan wear names on their uniforms, both in English and Arabic. Is the average Portland protester a greater menace than ISIS or Al Qaeda? And by the way, if you want a great breakdown between the differences between police tactics and army tactics, check out my friend Knowing Better's channel where he talks about his experience serving in the military in Afghanistan and the differences between military and police and the uh, overlap between the two as well. Legal commentator Ken White probably put it best, federalism, except for occupying cities and beating and detaining people on suspicion of vandalism. So now we get to the heart of the matter. Did federal Leos violate the law? Well, let's talk about the lack of identification. Why is it bad for law enforcement to go around without identification? Well, first and foremost, a person or suspect might refuse to respond to an order from a law enforcement official who doesn't clearly identify themselves. There's also the danger that various law enforcement officers might not be able to recognize each other, especially since many different military and police groups are involved in both, both DC and Portland. And riot helmets often have identifying numbers on their backs, partly for this reason. But the big reason, obviously, is that if officers don't identify themselves, then they can't be held accountable for their misbehavior. This is especially egregious because the protests are directly calling for police accountability. Anonymity it might be a good thing in war, but it's very bad when the officers are controlling demonstrations in their own country. And the precise legal question of whether it's reasonable for an officer to refuse to identify him or herself by name and state who he works for has not really been decided by federal courts. Obviously, when officers are undercover, it would be reasonable for them to remain anonymous. But in situations like a protest, 
It's vitally important for people to know that they're being stopped by police instead of by civilians. And courts have generally held that officers should identify themselves in these situations, but it's still a novel legal issue, at least from a, a federal standpoint. There's no federal law that requires federal law enforcement officers to wear a name tag, to wear a specific identifiable number that can be attributed to the individual officer. In part, probably because Federal law enforcement has been very, very curtailed in where it can be used in the US. And it's really very recently that they are expanding outside of their clear mandate. But just because there's no federal law that applies here doesn't mean that state law doesn't control. And while there is no federal law requiring federal officers to wear insignia identifying themselves or uh, individual name tags, Oregon law does require any law enforcement officers purporting to enforce state law to conspicuously display an official identification card showing the officer's lawful authority. Oregon authorizes federal officers to enforce state law, but only under specific circumstances. A federal officer may arrest someone for a crime committed in the officer's presence if the person has probable cause. Under Oregon's authorization of federal law enforcement officers, a federal officer may arrest someone for a crime committed in the officer's presence if the person has probable cause. The officer informs the person to be arrested of the officer's authority and reason for the arrest, and the officer takes the arrested person to a peace officer or magistrate without delay. And there's one other legal requirement. The federal officer cannot make arrests for state criminal violations unless they receive Oregon training and are certified by the state. This tells us some important things. First, a federal CBP officer could arrest someone for a violation of Oregon state law, but only if they have probable cause. Second, the arrest is only legal if the officer tells the person the basis for their authority, who they are and who they work for. And third, the federal officer must swiftly bring that person before a judge or magistrate so they're notified about their charges and rights. And fourth, the federal officer must be certified by the state of Oregon to make arrests pursuant to law. Which takes us to the first of many lawsuits here. Based on what we know, it doesn't seem like the federal officers in Portland can prove that they meet one or any of these conditions. Oregon Governor Kate Brown and Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler have implored DHS to remove CBP and other federal officers from the state. The Oregon Department of Justice has filed a lawsuit accusing DHS and other agencies of unlawful law enforcement. In addition to CBP, the state has identified other active law enforcement agencies as the U.S. Marshal Service and the Federal Protective Service. The failure of federal officers to identify themselves is actually one of the reasons for this lawsuit. The complaint names 10 John Doe defendants who are just placeholders that you put in a lawsuit complaint until you know the actual identity of that person and names the 10 Doe defendants who quote, have made it impossible for them to be individually identified by carrying out law enforcement actions without wearing any identifying information, even so much as the agency that employs them. The lawsuit seeks a temporary restraining order to prevent federal authorities from unlawfully detaining Oregon residents like Mark Pettibone. According to the suit, Oregonians have the right to walk through downtown Portland at night and in the early hours of the morning. Ordinarily, a person exercising his right to walk through the streets of Portland who is confronted by anonymous men in military type fatigues and ordered into an unmarked van can reasonably assume that he's being kidnapped and is the victim of a crime. This suit alleges that this is an unreasonable search and seizure in violation of the Fourth Amendment, which will be repeated if the federal government is not enjoined from its activities. The complaint alleges that this activity of federal law enforcement officers violate Oregon citizens' First Amendment right to protest, since, quote, citizens who are reasonably afraid of being picked up and shoved into unmarked vans, possibly by federal officers, possibly by individuals opposed to protests, will feel compelled to stay away for their own personal safety and will therefore be unable to express themselves in the way that they have a right to do. The state attorney general alleges that the federal government did not notify or coordinate with state officers. Essentially, the state is saying that the federal government just showed up to the protest without any request from state or local authorities or training by the state. The ACLU of Oregon has also filed a lawsuit against the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Marshal Service. The ACLU's lawsuit seeks to block federal law enforcement from dispersing, arresting, threatening to arrest, or using physical force against journalists or legal observers. The plaintiffs in that case include the newspaper of the Portland Mercury and individual journalists and legal observers who say that they were attacked by federal law enforcement. The ACLU is planning several lawsuits on behalf of protesters who say that their rights were violated. So this may be the tip of the iceberg. So is this a constitutional crisis of the federal government against the states? Well, Governor Brown has told federal officers to get out and President Trump said no. The federal government has officially refused the state's request to withdraw federal law enforcement from the state. 
The state can argue that it has certain powers reserved to it by the 10th Amendment. And while there's a real difficulty balancing governmental response to domestic crises, states generally have flexibility and authority to respond as they see the needs of their citizens. And at the same time, the federal government also has a right to respond to federal crises. The video that I did a few weeks back on Posse Comitatus and the Insurrection Act laid out some of these issues. The founders were afraid of concentrating too much power in the presidency or the federal government. And one of the checks on a tyrannical government was to give states the power to overrule the federal government during certain conflicts. And a lot of the power that we assume the federal government has might have been reserved for states because of the 10th Amendment. However, the Trump administration can counter and say that it's merely protecting federal property and that the CBP is legally permitted to help Federal Protective Service protect federal buildings. And that might effectively give the president a big personal army of more than 60,000 employees and officers. And while in the abstract, this might not be the worst thing. Of course, the federal government needs law enforcement officers to enforce federal laws. Unfortunately, we're seeing a pattern here. As we've learned over the past three months, the Trump administration will meet vandalism and property damage with an overwhelming show of paramilitary force against American citizens. And in DC, Effectively, Bill Barr, Attorney General, was in charge, but here it's the acting director of Department of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, who has not been confirmed by the Senate. I don't need invitations by the state, uh, state mayors or uh, state governors to do our job. We're going to do that uh, whether they like us there uh, mm -hmm. or not. And his acting deputy, Ken Cuccinelli, who's also the acting director of Citizenship and Immigration Services, CIS, has also not been confirmed by the Senate. And a federal court ruled that Cuccinelli was not lawfully appointed to his position and therefore he lacked authority to issue several directives pertaining to immigration, but he's still on the job. And in fact, he has two jobs. Moreover, Mark Morgan, the acting director of CBP, also has not been confirmed by the Senate and neither has Matthew Albans, the acting head of ICE or his acting deputy, Derek Benner. And of course, the pattern of a mouse wanting a cookie and a glass of milk continues. Lawfare reports that an internal DHS memo authorizes intelligence collection of Americans in order to protect statutes and memorials. The Department of Homeland Security says that their intelligence and analysis office is, quote, collecting and reporting on various activities in the context of elevated threats, targeting monuments, memorials, and statues. And it gives legal guidance concerning the, quote, expanded intelligence activities necessary to mitigate the significant threat to Homeland Security posed by such activities. Again, we're talking about statues here. The intelligence collection is authorized to prevent, quote, damage sufficient to impede the purpose or function of monuments. If you know how to impede the purpose or function of a monument or statue, please tell me in the comments. And of course, the pattern continues again. Uh, DHS is apparently making plans to send over 150 agents to Chicago for unknown reasons under unknown authority. This is obviously a very worrying trend, but thankfully there are brave souls out there willing to legally observe these protests and tell us what is happening. Thanks to them, we have video of what happened to Christopher David in Portland, who stood in front of the federal law enforcement officers and asked them about the oath that they took to the constitution while they pummeled him and broke two bones in his hand and he just stood there like a friggin' tree. And if you go out in the protest like Christopher David uh, and the person that recorded what happened to him and want to put together the best videos you can, you should take Penny Lane's Skillshare class, filmmaking from home, turn found footage into a compelling video. Ah, uh, 2020 where even the segues are incredibly dark. Penny's class will help you take your footage and turn it into a compelling video. Like how the federal government is usurping states and turning cities into occupied paramilitary zones. Penny developed a unique approach to storytelling that transforms existing content from historical archives to YouTube videos into innovative or irreverent films. Skillshare, as you know, is an online learning community that has tens of thousands of classes on everything like music, design, technology, and business. Now a yearly membership is less than $10 per month, but the first 1000 Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare when you click on the link below. Plus clicking on that link really helps out this channel. The free premium membership gives you unlimited access to must know topics so you can improve your skills and learn new things. All free for two months. Just click on the link below to get two free months of Skillshare. So do you agree with my analysis? Do you think that there should be limits on federal law enforcement uh, being used in the States? Leave your objections in the comments and check out my other real law reviews over here where I talk about all of the legal issues in the day and all the crazy things that are happening in our city. So click on this link and I'll see you in court.